So we're going to look at some of our different phytoplankton phylums. Okay, there's four phytoplankton phylums that we're going to look at. You have cyanophyta, chrysophyta, haptophyta, and dinophyta. You looked at three of these during your lab, right? You looked at cyanophyta, those are the blue-green algae. Okay, you looked at chrysophyta, those are the diatoms. And then you also looked at the dinophyta, the dinoflagellates. Okay, so you, you've seen three of these under the microscope already. We divide phytoplankton into their phylums based on two things. Number one, their pigments, what pigments they have. And then number two, how they store their sugars. So based on those two things, we divide them into phylums. Okay, the first phylum are the blue-green algae, okay, the cyanophytes. Um, these guys are typically found out in the open ocean away from places where there's lots of nutrients, so um, by the equator out in the open ocean. They are special because they are nitrogen fixers. What does that mean? Well, basically, um, all living things need nitrogen as an essential nutrient because nitrogen is, form, is part of amino acids which form um, um, proteins. Okay? And so all proteins in your body have nitrogen in them. Um, and most of the nitrogen on Earth is found in the form of nitrogen gas. Okay? That is a form that is not usable to living things. So nitrogen fixers actually take that nitrogen gas, which is unusable, and converts it into ammonia, which is a usable form. Okay? So uh, these, and there's very, very few things on Earth that actually have this ability to be able to fix nitrogen. And blue-green algae are one of them. Kind of cool. Okay? And so they actually allow for life to exist because they fix nitrogen. Does that make sense? Okay. Diatoms. Okay, diatoms have cell walls that are made out of silica or glass. Okay, they have glass cell walls. Um, and their glass cell walls are made out of two pieces that fit together perfectly, and we call it a frustule. It's called a frustule. Um, and they don't dissolve easily, clearly, because it's glass, and we put water into glass because that's, it doesn't dissolve and it holds water well, right? So their free stool does not dissolve easily, which um, has some implications for their reproduction, which I will talk about in just a moment. But there are three major type shapes of diatoms, and you saw these in your lab. The centric, okay, which are the round triangles or um, squares, chains, Okay, which is the middle one, a bunch of them joined together. And then the pennate, which is at the bottom, they're the long and skinny ones. Okay. So reproduction in diatoms. Because they have this glass cell wall that's so hard to like, kind of deal with, it doesn't dissolve easily, and it's not like you can grow and make your glass cell wall bigger. Okay. Um, they actually have to have a special form of reproduction uh, in order to deal with this. So they have both two forms of reproduction. They have asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. Here's what happens. So you've got your original cell over here, okay? And when that cell divides, each of the daughter cells gets half of that frustule. You see that? So when this divides, this cell gets the red half, this cell gets the green half. You see that? Okay. When they divide, um, a diatom always produces the smaller half of the frustule. Okay, so when this cell divides, the, ha the one that gets the red half, it produces the smaller half of the fruit stool, and this one is the same size as this one. You see that? Okay, however, um, the one that gets the smaller half, the green half, it produces the smaller piece of the fruit stool, and so now this cell is smaller than that one. You see that? Now when this one divides, okay, one gets the smaller piece, and it creates, uh, again, the smaller piece that fits inside of it, and so now this cell is smaller than this cell, which is smaller than that one. You see that? And it divides again, and it gets the smaller piece again, okay? And so now uh, this cell is smaller than this one, smaller than this one, okay? So eventually, as diatoms divide, some of the cells get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You see that? Okay. So once those cells get too small, they switch to sexual reproduction. Here's what happens. That little cell actually, instead of dividing asexually, forms gametes, eggs and sperm, okay? And then it will release those gametes into the water, and another gamete from another diatom that's nearby doing the same thing will come, they'll fuse, form the zygote, that will grow back into the original size cell, and then that cell will go through the asexual reproduction phase again. Does that make sense? So 
So they have both sexual and asexual phases of life. Cool, huh? All in a single-celled plant. Weird. Haptophyta. Haptophyta are coccolithophores. Okay, they are central in common, or sorry, in central parts of the ocean and in polar regions. Um, and they're called coccolithophores because they make um, these little things called coccolith. Okay, they're the, they are these little plates right here. Okay, so each of those little things is a, called a coccolith. It's made of calcium carbonate, limestone, okay, um, like chalk. Okay, think of like chalk. Uh, and they form these little coccoliths inside their little single cell, and then they push it to the outside of their cell and like form the cell wall surrounding them. Okay, and it looks like this. This is the electron scanning microscope image. So you can see the detail. This up here, um, you can see like the little green part right there. Okay, that's the actual living part of the cell. And then this kind of fuzzy stuff around there, that, that's the cell wall uh, made out of the coccolith. Yes, Harrison. So, their coccoliths are made out of calcium carbonate, um, white, chalky stuff, okay? Uh, and again, these don't dissolve very easily in water either. So what happens is when they die, their coccoliths settle to the bottom and uh, can become compacted. If there's a, enough of them that fall to the bottom, they become compacted. And then through tectonic activity, they can be raised back up above water and will form formations like this, the White Cliffs of Dover okay, in England. The White Cliffs of Dover are made from two types of plankton, phytoplankton. One of those types is coccolithophores. So plankton make up the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, also because coccolithophores, their shells are white, when, you, when they bloom, you can actually see it from space because they change the color of, wa of the water. So you can see like the little like lighter patch right there. That's a coccolithophore bloom. So they change the color of the water. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's cool. That's a lot of phytoplankton. Okay, dinoflagellates. Hey, um, dinoflagellates, you saw some dinoflagellates for your lab. And dinoflagellates are pretty cool. Um, how many of you have ever seen a red tide? Have you seen a red tide? Okay. So that's when you go to the beach and um, the water looks kind of red, okay, because of these dinoflagellates. So when they bloom, when they have an explosive population growth, um, dinoflagellates have a red pigment in them. They look red. So when there's lots of them, they actually change the color of the water and they look, the water looks red. How many of you have seen, um, gone to the beach during a red tide at night? Have you seen the waves glow? Okay. So the waves glow. So when um, certain kinds of dinoflagellates will do this process that we call bioluminescence, so um, they produce light. And when they get disturbed, they produce light. So at night, you can actually see the waves glowing. Let me show you a short little video here. Of um, Yes, these typically happen during um, the summer. So let's fast forward here. So these are people surfing during the red tide. Um, and you can see the waves glowing. See the blue? Okay, that's the, that, those are the dinoflagellates producing that light. So yeah, see that? Isn't that awesome? When the, and you can see like when the waves crash, it glows. So you can see it from the shoreline. You can see the, the waves glow. Isn't that cool? It does light up the sharks and stuff too. So, pretty awesome. No, uh, during the summer, it'll happen. Okay, um, because that's when you get the blooms of phytoplankton. Um, some of these uh, dinoflagellates can also produce toxins. So, and they can actually, because they can produce toxins through this process that we call biomagnification, they can actually kill you. Okay, so here, here's the process of biomagnification. Basically, each 
Um, talk, each little dinoflagellate produces a toxin. Okay, and biomagnification takes the toxin that gets produced, and each step in the food chain, uh, the amount of toxin gets concentrated as you move up. Okay, so it gets concentrated about 10 times um, more every time you move up the food chain. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm handing you a paper clip if, if you're like in the front couple of rows. Okay, so you guys are going to be my dinoflagellates, and this paper clip represents the toxin that you produce. Okay? So, uh, sure. Okay. So you guys are my dinoflagellates. You guys produce toxins. Okay? And so let's say that Madison and Tasia are my muscles, and they're going to eat some of my dinoflagellates. And when they eat them, the toxins that are in the dinoflagellates get passed to them. So pass back your toxins, your paper clips, to... You get more. Yeah, you're going to get a bunch because you're going to eat a bunch of phytoplankton, right? Madison, how many do you have? Okay, good. Okay. So Tasia eats more, apparently. <laughs> okay, and so now let's say Cody goes to a restaurant and he eats those phytoplankton. Or sorry, not the phytoplankton, the mussels. So pass your, pass your toxins on to Cody. Okay, so now Cody, hard, fi farther up in the food chain, okay, he has all of the toxins now in him. And so now they, they're at a high enough concentration where they can actually do him harm. Does that make sense? It doesn't kill the muscles because they don't get a high enough concentration, but when you eat the muscle, then you get sick. Okay, and so you can get what's called amnesic shellfish poisoning or paralytic shellfish poisoning. And um, it's exactly what you, it sounds like. Amnesic shellfish poisoning, you get amnesia from eating shellfish. Um, paralytic shellfish poisoning, it causes paralysis of nerves and both can kill you. Okay, yeah, if you eat and get enough of this toxin in your body. Regardless. So what happens is you, we actually have this thing called the Muscle Watch Program where scientists monitor the health of the muscles and make sure that they are, uh, the muscles that are going to the restaurants and stuff are fine for you to eat. It's shellfish. So mussels, clams, oysters, anything really that's a filter feeder, that will happen to you. So we, we monitor that. So it's very, very rare that if you go to a restaurant, you'll get one of these um, muscles. Yeah, it would be like people that go to the shoreline in order to collect the mussels and then go home and cook them. And if you go to the shore and you see a sign like this, that means those mussels are poisonous. Don't eat them. Okay? So um, if you ignore that, you can get sick. And if you do eat a mussel or something, a shellfish that is toxic, has the toxins in it, um, you will start to feel like your lips will start to tingle and your fingertips will start to tingle, and then you get super sick. Like you get diarrhea, you get shaking, you get disorientation. Depending on the amount of toxins, you may you know, start having trouble with your heartbeat, um, and it paralyzes the nerves that go to your diaphragm and it stops you from breathing and you die. So uh, that takes a little while. But if you eat it and your, finger, your fingertips and your lips start to tingle, go to the hospital right away. Yeah, you, they can save you because they'll put like a tube down your throat, right, and breathe for you. So then you'll be fine and your body will work the toxins out eventually. So, yeah. Okay. So these do... These do affect um, marine animals. So these blooms of toxic phytoplankton do affect marine animals. So the, but the higher level of the food chain, right, that are eating the things that have uh, more toxins in them because of biomagnification. So it's going to affect things like bird seals and sea lions. Um, and it's also going to, like, dinoflagellates will affect whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions as well. Um, and you'll see they'll be like, very disoriented, they'll look sick and like have all sorts of problems and um, it's probably because they got sick with this gamoic acid poisoning. Okay, so this is pictures of red tides. Okay, so this picture on the left here, this is a dinoflagellate bloom, a red tide that's not toxic. Okay, and then this one on the right, okay, this is a toxic dinoflagellate bloom. Okay, also a red tide. Um, when you get 
uh, dinoflagellates blooming that do have toxins, we call it a harmful algal bloom. Okay, so you'll see that HAB, harmful algal bloom, that's toxic phytoplankton. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because they're different species, they, they have different pigments, so they look different colors, but um, you won't always just be able to tell like that. Um, 